chapter eighteen part two of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter eighteen part two jack had been so busily employed in defending the brig that he had had no time to attend to anything else he now for a moment turned his glance to windward when he immediately discovered the cause of the slaver's flight standing towards him and coming on at a rapid rate was a ship carrying a press of sail and a schooner which was quickly recognized as the venus by the cut of her sails as well as by their snowy whiteness he could scarcely doubt that the large vessel was the corvette yet it would have been impossible for the venus to have gone to port royal and to have returned in so short a time the slaver without firing a shot was doing her best to escape by setting all the sail she could carry her crew being actively employed in knotting and splicing the rigging which needham's shot had already somewhat damaged try one more exclaimed jack and good luck go with it needham took good aim the shot passing through the main topsail struck the foretop mast which fell over the side a loud cheer burst from the throats of the english crew and all hands redoubled their efforts in repairing their own damages they were soon able to set the foretop sail and jib and get the brig about and away they went in hop chase after their antagonist the latter had not hitherto shown her colours she now hoisted an american ensign but that did not save her from another iron missile thrown from long tom she on this quickly exchanged the american colours for those of spain which however were treated in the same way and finding at length that she had no chance of escaping from her active pursuer she hauled them down and hove to jack ordered a boat to be lowered and directed needham and the only midshipman remaining with him to board the prize his other officers the doctor and purser being busily engaged with the wounded men needham was quickly alongside and stepping on board he found that out of her crew of forty hands six had been killed and eight or ten severely wounded while her bulwarks and the companion hatch had been considerably knocked about among the killed was her first officer whilst the captain and several others were wounded needham as directed inquired for her papers and what is the name of this craft of yours he asked when they were given to him the black swan was the answer well now i shouldn't be surprised if you called her the katerina you would be somewhere nearer the truth the captain started but made no reply come i am to take you on board our brig continued needham making a sign to the captain to get into the boat jack as soon as he could possibly be spared off the deck went below to ascertain how don lopez and his companions had made their escape from the cabin it was very evident that they had broken open the door that the sentry had been surprised and overpowered before he could use his musket instead of murdering him which it was a wonder they had not done they had gagged and put him into the irons from which they had released one of their companions he still sat in a corner of the gun-room looking very much alarmed and not a little ashamed of himself in a short time the schooner and corvette brought up by the freshening breeze were close to and murray at once came on board the supplejack i heartily congratulate you on having captured the brig before i came up he exclaimed as he and jack shook hands i should have been sorry to have deprived you of the honour which is your due thank you answered jack but i suspect that we should not have found it so easy a matter to capture her had you not made your appearance in the nick of time we were hard pressed i can assure you for the dons fought well and it was all we could do to drive them back when they attempted to board us besides which our prisoners broke loose and would have given us a good deal of trouble before we had knocked them on the head but how came you to arrive so opportunely 
i was sent by the admiral in quest of you to direct you to return to port royal from whence we are to sail immediately in company for trinidad we are not likely to remain there long and are afterwards the admiral tells me not a usual proceeding to be placed under the orders of the admiral on the south american station for your sake i am sorry that you are to leave the west indies though i shall not be sorry to visit fresh scenes and get a little cooling after two years broiling in these seas said jack but how did you leave your friends at st david's murray looked grave as he answered miss o'regan has not recovered as rapidly as i trusted she would from the trials she has gone through and i think it probable that she will accompany some of her relatives to england so that i cannot hope to meet her again till we return home indeed she is firm in her determination not to marry at all events till i pay off the corvette and i suppose she is right although i would rather make her mine at once archy gordon i am thankful to say under her and her friend's care is gradually recovering and will i hope in a few weeks join the frigate however you must not forget your prize here comes your boat with her skipper the spanish captain now stepped on board and protested loudly against the legality of his capture and declared that the english brig-of-war had fired into him without provocation and that he had been obliged to board her as the only means of saving his vessel very probably answered jack and you expected to take us and our prizes into the bargain as to the legality of the affair that will be decided when we arrive at jamaica in the meantime as i am overcrowded you and your officers will go on board the corvette where your wounds will be attended to murray had agreed to relieve jack of some of his prisoners and to send a prize crew on board the caterina all arrangements having been made the two men of war and four prizes made sail for port royal scarcely had they got their tacks aboard than a large ship was sighted from the masthead of the tudor standing off the land she was soon made out to be the plantagenet which had sailed from port royal ten days before her the frigate made the signal to close and the small squadron was soon hove to at a short distance from her as directly afterwards it fell calm visits were exchanged between the officers of the different ships murray and jack went on board the plantagenet to make their report to captain hemming you have had better fortune than we can boast of rogers he said laughing in a tone which showed his vexation those rascally slave-dealers have contrived to do us though as we are up to their tricks i hope that we shall turn the tables on them another time when jack went into the gun-room adair gave him an account of the circumstance to which the captain alluded we were on our way from jamaica to havana to look after you jack and to prevent you from getting into mischief or catching a tartar as it seems you nearly did when the captain thought fit to stand into the bay of guantimo it's away there on the southern coast of cuba towards the east end the admiral had received information that don pepe the very rascal whose acquaintance we made on the coast of africa and who is now settled at havana was fitting out a large and powerful craft calculated to give a little pygmy like you some trouble we came up guantimo just before dark it is i should say a beautiful and deep bay with numerous small harbours in it in which slavers may hide securely without any risk of being seen by our cruisers unless expressly looked for as we were standing in intending to run up the bay we made out a large brig at anchor with sails loose ready for sea she had a suspicious look about her unusually square yards taunt and raking masts and low black hull though she might be well armed and disposed to show fight had you for instance attempted to question her she would not of course dare to resist the frigate and as she could not escape us we felt pretty sure that should she be what we suspected she would soon become our prize we had got some little way up the bay and within half a mile of her when the wind fell we were by this time more certain than ever from her appearance that she was a slaver 
and the captain therefore ordered a shot to be fired close ahead of her that we might see how she would take it she made no reply neither hoisted colours nor attempted to get under way at all events we will see what she is said the captain he then ordered me and norris to take the pinnace and jolly-boat and board her the men had just time to buckle on their cutlasses before they tumbled into the boats i was sorry after we had shoved off that they were not better armed for the spaniards might very possibly try to play us some trick or other such as heaving cold shot into our boat and knocking us on the head as we got alongside though they were much more likely to blow up their vessel or to run her on shore and make their escape as we pulled on we observed numerous boats passing from the brig to the shore and we felt pretty certain that the fellows were landing the unfortunate slaves so that we should not be in time to rescue them i ordered our men to give way in the hopes of saving some of the poor wretches and a single slave remaining on board would of course be enough to condemn her it was now nearly dark though we could still make out the brig with her white canvas loose not far ahead i was somewhat surprised as we approached to observe no sign of life aboard her not a man could i make out on her deck no boat alongside we had got almost up to her when we observed a large schooner lying close in shore on the farther side of a high point which had hitherto concealed her from us almost at the same instant a shot came flying from the schooner towards us so well aimed that as it struck the surface it threw the water right over us the splash of our oars must have shown the schooner's people where we were for although we could see her they could not have made out in the dark such small objects as our boats the first shot was followed by a second which very nearly did for the jolly boat as after striking the water it bounded over her smashing one of her oars and knocking in her gunwale happily hitting no one not wishing to be exposed to this sort of peppering as shot after shot came in quick succession giving us not a most agreeable kind of shower-bath we at once dashed at the brig i boarding on the starboard side and norris on the port we fully expected to have some hot work but on reaching the deck not a soul appeared and we found ourselves masters and as we supposed possessors of as fine a brig as i have ever seen engaged in the slave trade i could not help feeling however a little uncomfortable on recollecting the tricks the rascals are apt to play and i half expected to find myself and my men hoisted into the air by the explosion of the magazine when as i was about to send below to examine the vessel i heard voices in the after cabin and presently a spanish officer in full rig appeared followed by half a dozen men of war's men he announced himself as a midshipman belonging to the spanish man-of-war schooner which lay at anchor in shore the same craft which had fired at us and said that he had been put in charge of the brig which had been captured by his vessel and pray then why did your schooner fire at our boats i asked eyeing the young fellow narrowly for i much doubted that he was really a midshipman your boats were seen approaching our prize under suspicious circumstances in the dusk of evening and you probably were taken for pirates he answered quite coolly there was light enough when we were first seen to make out our ensign i answered if that schooner is a man of war her commander shall be made to apologize for the insult he has offered to the british flag of course he will and if you choose to send on board you will find that what i have told you is the case he answered biting his lips as if so i supposed he disliked having his honour doubted well you will remain here and i will send one of my boats on board the schooner should any treacherous trick be played i shall make you answerable i said eyeing him sternly he did not quail and i was pretty well satisfied that he spoke the truth i accordingly ordered norris to go on board the schooner and ascertain the facts of the case and to tell the captain that i wished to see him immediately on board the brig after he was gone i felt no little anxiety as to the reception he might meet with the spanish midshipman however appeared at his ease and accompanied me over the brig i found that she was a brand-new vessel having never before been to sea 
she was laden with cotton goods and had the planking for a slave deck with leaguers and a large cauldron for boiling farina indeed she was in every way fitted for a slaver and would i felt sure if we could not stop her career bring back some seven or eight hundred slaves in her capacious hold she is a slaver you will allow i said turning to the midshipman a slaver he said worse than that she is a regular pirate as such we captured her notwithstanding what he said i was convinced that she was simply a slaver though the spaniards are generally in no hurry to take such vessels we returned on deck and i kept my eye on my friend and his men the brig's crew had all been removed he told me we shall see them then hanging at your yard-arm to-morrow morning i observed oh no we do not treat our prisoners in so summary a manner he answered we paced the deck for some time together while i turned a somewhat anxious eye towards the schooner hoping soon to see norris return norris as i afterwards learnt as he got near the spanish schooner observed her guns pointed down at his boat ready to sink her in a moment undaunted however he pulled alongside no opposition was offered to his coming on board when he got on deck he found the fighting lanterns ranged along it sixty marines drawn up with muskets in their hands and swords by their sides and fully two hundred men at their quarters at the gangway stood the captain a thin short wizened faced man with an immense moustache who as norris appeared began stamping with his feet and swearing roundly in spanish who are you how dare you go on board yonder brig he asked i am an officer of her britannic majesty's frigate plantagenet answered norris having a good notion of the proper way to meet such a fellow i obey the orders of my captain he supposes her to be a slaver and if she is not all i can say is she is very much like one she is not a slaver but a pirate and i have captured her under the same treaty that you english take slavers and she is therefore mine and under my charge and no one shall interfere with her in that case why did you fire at us i beg to know asked norris because it was dark and i could not see your flag answered the little don you could have seen our frigate and you must have known perfectly well all the time that the boats you were firing at were english replied norris my superior officer who has taken possession of the brig wishes to see you on board her immediately while norris was carrying on this conversation the spanish crew looked so bent on mischief and the moustaches of the marines curled so fiercely that he expected every moment to be attacked and he saw his own men put their hands on the hilts of their cutlasses as if they thought the same they would have had to contend with fearful odds but i have not the slightest doubt that they would have made a good fight of it and perhaps have got off scot free though they had not a pistol among them the spanish captain considered a moment and norris heard him order his gig to be manned well remember that my superior officer expects you he said and having no inclination to remain longer on board than was necessary ordering his men into the jolly-boat he came back as fast as they could pull to the brig he had just time to give me an account of what had occurred when we made out a spanish boat coming towards us i should have said by the by that alongside the captain was an englishman or a man who spoke english perfectly and interpreted for norris or at all events helped him out with the conversation i stood with my men ranged behind me their shirt-sleeves tucked up and their cutlasses in their hands ready to receive my visitor i determined to show him that i was not to be trifled with after his impudent behaviour he had no right to expect any courtesy from me so i let him find his own way on deck well signor i asked when he appeared followed by his interpreter how did you dare to fire at my boats instead of stamping and swearing as he had done when on board his own vessel he was in a moment an altered being taking off his hat he stood before me humbly bowing and with his hand on his heart declared that he much regretted what had occurred indeed signor i had no notion that the boats i fired at were english and took you for pirates about to attempt to recapture of the brig this was said by means of the interpreter 
that's as big a bouncer as ever was spoken i heard some one behind me growl out i don't know whether the interpreter thought fit to explain the polite remark to his superior as to that i have no means of judging but how comes it that i find one of your officers on board this vessel she is evidently fitted for the slave trade and as such she will most certainly be condemned i observed of course no doubt about it answered the spanish captain quite coolly she is not only a slaver but a pirate and discovering such to be the case i captured her and i give you my word of honour that i am about to take her into st iago da cuba for adjudication of course i cannot doubt the word of honour of a spanish officer i replied i must consequently leave you in possession and i only hope you will take care that she is condemned and her piratical career stopped oh of course signor i will take good care of that he answered again bowing and putting his hand to his heart i fancied that by the light of the lantern which fell on his countenance i could see a twinkle in his eyes as he said this and i felt strongly tempted to pitch him and his crew into their boat cut the brig's cable and make sail however as i was compelled to take his word for the truth of what he asserted i had nothing to do but to trundle with my men into our boats and pull back to the frigate hemming approved of what i had done though he agreed with me that it was all humbug and that the spanish captain pretended to have captured the brig for the sake of saving her from our claws he determined therefore to watch the two vessels and we accordingly hove to to see what they would do it was not till nearly dawn that the breeze came off the land when we saw the brig stealing out followed by the man-of-war schooner the latter by the by was a magnificent vessel one of the largest schooners i have come across requiring the numerous crew she carried to handle her enormous canvas we at once made sail and followed them into st iago which is about thirty miles west of guantimo we there found that the spanish captain had actually brought the brig to trial as a pirate though as he well knew there was not the slightest proof that she was one as the trial was likely to last some weeks or at all events till we were out of the port hemming considered that it would be useless to remain so we sailed again and were on our passage round to havana when we sighted you such was adair's account of his adventure a breeze soon afterwards springing up the plantagenet proceeded on to her destination while the corvette and brig with the prizes continued their course to jamaica it was not till the return of the plantagenet to port royal that jack heard of the full rascality of the spanish captain on the arrival of the frigate at havana captain hemming laid a complaint before the admiralty court for the adjudication of slavers he then discovered that the brig belonged to pepe or as he was now called don mateo who had bribed the spanish captain to keep by his vessel and to pretend to have captured her should an english man-of-war appear on the acquittal of the brig for piracy at st iago the spanish captain who had pledged his honour on the subject escorted her through the windward passage as far as seventy degrees of longitude when she was out of the range of west india cruisers jack afterwards heard an account of her from a friend on the african station she had then really become a pirate she used to watch for the slavers after they had run the gauntlet of the british cruisers and would then capture them take their slaves out and give them her cargo of coloured cottons in exchange when she did not manage to fall in with slavers she occasionally took a run in on her own account and her captain being well informed of the movements of the blockading squadron she invariably managed to pick up a fresh cargo and get clear off again being however in no ways particular if she had no cargo of coloured cloths she would sink the slavers she took with their crews so as to leave no trace of the transaction behind being armed with a long gun amidships and six long nines not a slaver had a chance with her it was not till long afterwards that jack became acquainted with the last mentioned particulars she at length disappeared from the coast and he could never hear what ultimately became of her she was probably either burnt or driven on shore or still more likely she was capsized and went down with her living freight of eight hundred human beings End of chapter eighteen
section twenty three of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter nineteen part one the tutor and supplejack at trinidad jack's account of his trip up the orinoco the vice-consul and his belongings a knowing pilot tom bit by a turtle tortoises the brig among the trees the tutor once more came to an anchor off port of spain in the beautiful island of trinidad terence adair had been appointed to her as first lieutenant and higson as second she was accompanied by the supplejack of which rogers still retained the command with bevan as his senior officer jos green as master and needham as boatswain the old shipmates were thus much to their satisfaction still employed together as soon as the sails were furled murray went on shore accompanied by jack and terence taking with them tom and gerald hickson had insisted on doing adair's duty of course you will want to go and call on your fair cousins and i never have been nor ever shall be a lady's man so they would not be well pleased to see me in your stead he said as he made the offer which terence very readily accepted after murray had delivered his dispatches to the governor he rejoined the two lieutenants who had in the meantime gone to pay a visit to antonio gomez they found the don just starting out for his country house and he as they expected at once ordered horses and insisted that they should accompany him donna caterina and her daughters will be delighted to see you and would not pardon me if i did not bring you along with me he said in a warm hearty tone they will be anxious to hear all about their sweet friend stella and what you have been doing since you were here last we some time ago received an account of colonel o'regan's death well well poor man i confess it was only what i expected he seemed determined to court such a fate and i could never make out why a person who could honourably live at his ease at home should be so eager to knock his head against stone walls however the tastes of people differ the horses having arrived the philosophical don led the way with murray by his side the party received a hearty welcome as before from donna caterina and her fair daughters and terence as usual had a long conversation with the old lady about bally macree he had however not much news to tell her he had only occasionally heard from home and the letters he had received were brief stating simply that things went on as usual gerald however pleased her much by showing her the letter from his mother in which she expressed her gratitude for the kindness he had received from his west india cousins though they had not been informed of murray's engagement to stella they very quickly guessed the truth and by adroitly questioning the midshipmen ascertained all particulars as far as they were known jack and terence very nearly lost their hearts as the young ladies were thus able to concentrate all those efforts to attract them which might have been expended in vain on the young commander but as they returned to their ships early the next morning they quickly recovered their usual serenity of mind i am afraid they would be very miserable at halliburton and i somewhat doubt whether mary and lucy would quite like them as sisters-in-law observed jack to terence while they were freely discussing the young ladies maybe the dear creatures wouldn't be quite as happy as i should wish them to be at ballymacree seeing that they mightn't take altogether to our ways said terence so i don't think that i'll make the promise i was meditating of coming back some day or other when i am a commander for instance and carrying one of them over to ireland with me 
on returning to town murray again called on the governor who told him that he had received a communication from a certain senor bernardo guedes acting as british consul at angostura up the orinoco complaining of outrages inflicted on certain british subjects as well as on himself and requesting that a man-of-war might be sent to punish the offenders as the navigation of the river is however very difficult i doubt whether a ship of any size could get up though perhaps the smallest of your vessels would be able to do so he added murray of course said that he should be happy to send the supplejack up should her draught of water not be too great and that he could perfectly trust her commander lieutenant rogers to act with discretion in the matter senhor bernardo soon afterwards made his appearance he had not only come himself to make his complaint but had brought his wife with him without whom he observed he never moved from home he was not a very favourable specimen of a british consul and it was difficult to say how he had attained the post he was a short dark-skinned personage with apparently a mixture of negro blood in his veins with considerable volubility though in somewhat broken english he repeated all his complaints and finished up requesting that he might be conveyed with his wife back to his home but as we are not acquainted with the navigation it would be impossible for the brig to go up without a pilot observed murray oh dat sir i will provide he answered i will obtain the services of anselmo he knows every inch of de way up to agostura each sandbank and every snag i might almost say you saw the brig of war in the harbour do you think she will be able to get up so far asked murray oh yes captain your big ship even would get up as the waters are rising at present sure she might to be sure stick coming down though answered the consul thank you i should prefer then not attempting to take her up said murray laughing well captain murray i will leave you to make arrangements with the consul and i conclude that lieutenant rogers will be ready to give this gentleman and his wife a passage observed the governor i can answer for that answered murray as he took his leave accompanied by signor guedes he returned to the quay i conclude mr consul that you and your lady will be ready to go on board the brig this evening as she will sail to-morrow morning by daylight said murray where is signora guedes residing she my wife is on board that schooner dare the mail packet in which we came from angostura i left her locked up in the cabin answered the consul locked up in the cabin exclaimed murray with no little surprise beginning to suspect that rogers would have curious passengers on board the supplejack oh yes sir i always lock up my wife when i do go out for she is young you see and it is the safest plan she can then no run away herself and no one can run off with her that what i always fear it make my life miserable at angostura and this curious representative of the majesty of england shrugged his shoulders and made a grimace which showed the intensity of his feelings well go and get your wife and your traps and i will inform lieutenant rogers of the governor's wishes that he should afford you and your wife a passage home thank you sir answered signor guedes bowing low as he strutted off to a boat and returned on board the schooner which lay at a short distance from the shore murray had invited rogers to dine on board the tudor and a very pleasant party the three old messmates had they talked of times gone by and enjoyed a hearty laugh at the description murray gave of the consul and his fair partner 
i shall be happy to give up my cabin to the lady but i hope her husband won't lock her in it during the whole voyage at all events he cannot be afraid of any one running away with her while we are at sea i wish you may at all events enjoy the company of your passengers said adair laughing i want you to write me a full account of what occurs or the chances are that by the time you rejoin us you will have forgotten all about it jack promising to comply with adair's request returned to the supplejack somewhat earlier than he would otherwise have done that he might be on board to receive his expected guests he at once gave orders to his steward to clear out his cabin and prepare it for the reception of the consul's lady however as jack faithfully fulfilled his promise to adair we have the opportunity of giving an account of the expedition in his own words i had been walking the deck for some time thinking now of one thing now of another when a boat with two persons in the stern sheets came alongside and answered to the quartermaster's hail her majesty's british consul of angostura and his family the accommodation ladder had already been rigged in preparation for the arrival of these important personages the sides being manned the next instant a, a stout gentleman who must be i knew the consul began to ascend shoving up before him a veiled female figure she i rightly guessed was his wife i advanced to meet them and was about to address the lady when her husband informed me that she no speak english and as she is very tired she wishes at once to go to her cabin i accordingly conducted the veiled lady below from her figure and a glimpse i caught of her countenance as the light from the lamp fell on it as by chance of course her veil fell on one side i saw that she was young and undoubtedly pretty thus accounting for the jealousy displayed by her lord and master the old gentleman followed and remained for a short time in the cabin when he came out i observed that he examined the door and seemed rather nonplussed on discovering that there was no key with which he could follow his usual custom of locking up his better half i invited him to walk the deck with me that he might give me a fuller account of the circumstances which had occurred at angostura requiring the visit of a british man-of-war he told me a long rigmarole tale of an attack which had been made on his house by a party of brigands as he called them from venezuela the chief object of which as he suspected was to carry off his wife however they or some one else had pulled down the consular flagstaff a half-caste who claimed to be a british subject belonging to trinidad had been killed and two or three others had been made prisoners all the time he was speaking he was in a state of agitation and soon hurried back into the cabin to ascertain as he said whether his wife wanted anything he supped with us in the gun-room and though he played a very good knife and fork he exhibited the same uneasiness jumping up two or three times during the meal to pay his spouse a visit mctavish who had not suspected the cause of his anxiety remarked that he had never seen more devoted affection displayed and that he could not help admiring the old gentleman though he owned that he possessed very few other likable qualities for my own part i did not anticipate much pleasure in the society of my guests by break of day we got under way and stood for the boca de huevos or the umbrella passage till i consulted our sailing directions i had fancied that we might have made a short cut to the southward through one of the serpent's mouths but the hot current which sets into the gulf of paria caused by the immense mass of water flowing out of the orinoco would have effectually prevented us from gaining our object the longest way round therefore was the shortest to our destination a fresh breeze on our quarter enabled us to get out into the open sea sooner than i expected when we stood along the northern shore of trinidad to the eastward 
we carried the breeze with us till we rounded the point of galera i should not have supposed that trinidad is the fertile place it really is from the appearance of its northern shore which is that of an immense ridge of barren rocks not indeed till we were running down the eastern coast did its rich and smiling valleys again appear in view i had good reason to be glad that we had not attempted the serpent's mouth for when standing across from the southern end of trinidad towards the orinoco the wind fell light and we were nearly swept by the current back again into the gulf even before we came in sight of the mainland we found ourselves sailing through the brown waters of the mighty stream which as we got near its many mouths became almost the consistency of pea-soup and we had to keep a lookout to avoid the huge trunks of trees swept out by the current the ends of some of which broken off by lightning or the wind might have made an ugly hole in our bows we stood for the centre and broadest entrance of the river the only one through which we could make our way up against the current and hove to off the far from attractive-looking town of cangreos here we were to find the consul informed me the trustworthy pilot anselmo a signal having been made for a pilot a canoe speedily put off from the shore bringing on board a big mulatto dressed in an excessively dirty white jacket and trousers with a broad-brimmed straw hat which had seen better days on his head he greeted the consul with a profound bow and introduced himself to me as de pilot of de orinoco who knowed every part of de river from one end to de other and take up all de english ships which come dere well signor anselmo do you think you can pilot this brig and carry her back again without leaving her high and dry on a sandbank i asked oh yes sir if she twice the size i take her up all de same he answered with a scornful laugh at the supposition that he might not fulfil his engagement signor guedos assured me that you were the best pilot to be found for the river i remarked at his request we hoisted up his canoe which contained a hammock and several articles which he had brought off to administer to his creature comforts the only fresh provisions that we were able to procure at the place were three turtles one of which was immediately put to death the others were slung in hammocks and secured to temporary stanchions fixed to the bulwarks we kept the reptiles alive by covering them with damp swabs which were continually wetted as the heat absorbed the water we had to wait till the next morning when the sea breeze set up the river to enable us to stem the muddy current the shores on either side as far as the eye could reach were covered with dense masses of mangrove trees which rose up out of the water no firm ground being visible on either side the scenery indeed was not attractive though we supposed that in time we should come to something more interesting it was satisfactory to find that we did make headway though slowly i have said nothing about signor guedes and his better half he allowed her to come out to meals but he sat opposite to her at table and fixed a glance at her all the time and frowned savagely if he saw her for a moment turn her eyes towards me had i not suggested for the sake of her health that she should be allowed to come on deck i believe he would have kept her shut up in the cabin for the whole voyage when she did appear she was closely veiled and he stood by her the whole time looking expressively angry when any of the officers approached her though as she did not speak english few of them could exchange a word with her before we got into the river he had some reason for keeping her in her cabin for the poor lady was very ill several times i heard her blue beard of a husband scolding her fearfully and i felt strongly inclined to pitch him overboard 
she recovered rapidly when she got into the river and was able to hold her own and prove that she could scold as well as he could i won't bother you with an account of our daily progress which was as i have said dreadfully slow i had expected to witness grand and majestic views on the orinoco the second river in point of size in south america but its very width is a drawback from any beauty it might possess and although aware that the trees on either side are of great height they are so far off as to appear like mere bulrushes growing out of the water while the mountains of which we caught sight were at such a distance as to produce but little effect in the landscape when the breeze was fresh we made tolerable way through the water but directly it fell we were compelled to anchor or we should have speedily been swept down and lost all the distance we had gained we had to bring up every night and for some hours during the day so you will understand what toilsome work it was i suggested one evening to anselmo that as he knew the river so well we might run on when the breeze favoured us during the night he shook his head answering oh no sir that is not to be done we get into mischief i only pilot for the day as the rascal was paid by the day he was in no hurry nothing i could say would induce him to take charge by night i tried what threatening would do but he only smiled as he well knew that he had us in his power having gone on deck some time after sunset one evening and found a steady breeze blowing up the stream i thought i would again try to overcome his resolution i sent the quartermaster of the watch to look for him but he was nowhere to be found anselmo was called along the lower deck no answer came at last turning my eyes aloft i observed something unusual in the rigging and there between the main and foremast was slung a hammock in which the rogue had stowed himself after he had been repeatedly hailed he looked out of his eyrie and getting into the main rigging came down i asked him why he had taken up his berth aloft because sir it dare cool and pleasant no mosquito plenty air he certainly was not likely to have been interrupted as long as the sails were furled though had he suddenly awoke he would have run a great risk of toppling down on deck habit however is second nature and he i dare say recollected even in his sleep where he was had i at the time known one of his peculiarities i should have kept a stricter watch on him than i had done hitherto i soon however found it out we were brought up one day for want of a breeze when an american schooner loaded with hides came rapidly gliding down the stream anselmo begged to have his canoe lowered as he said that he had friends on board whom he wished to see i gave him permission and after a brief visit to her he returned singing merrily as he got alongside and his canoe again at his request was hoisted up it did not occur to me to send any one to look into her or to look myself soon afterwards the schooner was out of sight after waiting for some time a breeze sprang up and as we had not anchored in any great depth of water we soon got the anchor to the bows and made sail anselma was more loquacious than usual we had gone up a mile or two when i felt the vessel touch the ground as the breeze freshened however she glided on stirring up the thick mud at the bottom i rated our pilot soundly but he only laughed observing oh signor capitan that is nothing i happened to remark that he made frequent visits to his canoe and in a short time after i went below when i returned on deck i found that he was completely drunk and not willing to trust the brig any longer to his charge as the wind also was falling i brought up of this fact however anselmo did not appear to be aware for he stood at his usual post conning her with the gravity of a post captain who has royalty on board his ship starboard now steady port he sung out every now and then while holding on by a stanchion to support himself notwithstanding which he occasionally surged forward and i thought would have tumbled over on his nose while of course he afforded infinite amusement to the midshipmen and crew 
we were unable to move again during the day notwithstanding his condition he managed to climb into his hammock and sleep away the fumes of liquor next morning he seemed greatly surprised to find that the brig had not made better way and declared that she had dragged her anchor as to his certain knowledge we had sailed on three or four hours after we had left the spot where we were now brought up we had eaten another of our turtles i had ordered the last to be killed and was standing aft watching a large cowfish which came sweeping by on our quarter its snout and shining body rising just above the surface when i heard a loud cry from tom and saw him with one hand in the turtle's hammock dancing up and down and crying lustily quick quick if you don't he will have my thumb off i ran forward to his assistance and found that having forgotten at which end the animal's head lay he had intended as he said to give its tail a pull when to his dismay the creature's mouth caught his thumb with a boat-hook fortunately at hand i managed to wrench open the turtle's mouth and extract tom's thumb had the creature been in full strength it would undoubtedly have bitten it off even as it was though at its last gasp it had given him an ugly grip which necessitated his being under the care of mctavish for several days of animal life we saw but little though birds of gay plumage flew across the stream and cowfish porpoises and other creatures gambled in the waters we met also several floating islands composed of trunks of trees bound together by their branches and interwoven by cypos or long vines sometimes they were even covered with grass and on one of them was a jaguar still feeding on its prey and not aware of the fate which to a certainty awaited it the animal had probably leaped on the island to seize a deer which had taken refuge there when the victim and its destroyer had been together swept away the latter being afraid to venture into the rushing stream to make its escape it was too far off to shoot indeed i had no rifle ready when passing near the trees which grew in the water for land was nowhere visible i caught sight of flocks of herons resting on the branches i went on one occasion when we had brought up in anselmo's canoe and in an hour killed a sufficient number of them to serve all hands for breakfast having consumed our last turtle we became badly off for fresh provisions as we generally anchored too far from the trees to get a shot at a bird or to catch any of the animals which inhabited them occasionally however we were visited by the canoes of the natives who supplied us with bananas coconuts and the dried flesh of some large fish the most welcome provisions they brought us were a number of small land tortoises a foot and a half or two feet in length which were as delicate as anything i could wish to eat as we got higher up the river became somewhat narrower and we thus frequently had to pass close to the trees we had been making good way one morning with a fresh breeze when as the day advanced the wind began to fall still anselmo encouraged us with the hope that it would get up again and we continued our course under all the sail we could spread as he appeared to be perfectly sober at the time i had not as i generally did kept an eye on him and therefore did not bring up as i should have done finding however that we were going astern i ordered the anchor to be dropped and sent the hands to furl sails the topsails and topgallant sails had fortunately been handed and the men were coming down from aloft when the brig swung right in among the trees and the end of a thick bough which had been shivered by lightning or broken off by a storm ran through the head of the mainsail just under the gaff there we lay with our fore topgallant and topsail yards caught in the branches and our mainsail securely locked a pretty job it will be to get clear i thought though at present the brig had suffered no great damage she was in a position in which it would not have been satisfactory to remain long and i therefore ordered a boat to be lowered to carry out a kedge as it was necessary however first to clear our mainsail and yards i sent some hands aloft with axes to chop away the network of vines 
the nooses of which nearly caught two or three fellows and swung them off the yards into the trees End of chapter nineteen part one section twenty four of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter nineteen part two spiders attempt to escape the midshipmen go in chase and lose themselves boarded by ants nearly take the brig search for the midshipmen in the forest a native habitation angostur and its people land the consul and his better half return the most excited person on board was the midshipman's pet master spider seeing the green foliage overhead he became inspired with the idea of visiting the haunts of his childhood the owners not thinking of this had allowed him to be loose up the rigging he sprang with tom and gerald after him they were very nearly as nimble as he was he had reached the fore topgallant yard close to which temptingly hung a mass of vines just such as one might suppose he had been accustomed to swing in in his early days into it he sprang and began to climb one of the many wide-spreading branches to which the vines were attached tom and gerald afraid of losing him followed and were soon lost to sight among the dense foliage i did not myself see this but supposed them still to be among the men on the yards for i was busy at the moment in getting the boat lowered and pointing out the direction in which the kedge was to be carried calling the men down i ordered them to haul away on the warp to get the head of the brig out again into the stream while however the branch was fixed in the mainsail this could not be done needham who saw what was necessary called for the assistance of the pilot who was a wonderfully strong man and having lowered the peak the two put their shoulders under the boom and by a wonderful exertion of strength lifted it out of the crutch and let it run forward at that moment a large mass fell from the branch on deck i turned round to ascertain what it was when i saw issuing from the fragments myriads of large ants which went crawling all over the deck oh they will bite us to death exclaimed anselmo making a bolt up the rigging needham who had already had his feet attacked followed his example the consul who had been sitting on deck with his wife well knowing the biting powers of the creatures seized her round the waist and attempted to carry her down the companion hatchway but in his terror he let her go by the run and she lay shrieking at the bottom for she was much hurt while he pitched down head foremost after her a whole army of ants following the deck literally swarmed with them the creatures came creeping forward attacking our shoeless feet and biting in a most frightful manner for the instant i thought that they would have driven me and my crew overboard the men at the warp quickly recovering hauled away as before though they were unable to withstand stamping and leaping in their vain efforts to free themselves of the fiery pests we had managed to get the brig free of the bows when i bethought me of attacking the creatures with water and ordering all the buckets to be filled we immediately began deluging the decks the ants which still remained on it being quickly swept through the scuppers numbers having however already gained the hammock nettings and rigging it was no easy matter to dislodge them bevan with the boat's crew who had gone off with the kedge fortunately for themselves escaped and he told me afterwards that not knowing what had happened he fancied for a moment that we were all gone mad from the curious way in which i setting the example every one on board had begun suddenly to leap and skip about a gouty gentleman subjected to the discipline we went through would quickly have been cured of his complaint our next puzzle was to get rid of the creatures in the rigging i partly accomplished the task by sending hands into the tops with buckets who dashed the water down in every direction to clear the cabin of them however was a more difficult task as soon as the deck was somewhat free i went down below where from the conversation i heard with occasional cries which proceeded from the cabin i guessed that the consul and his wife were employed in freeing their persons from the pests senhor guedes presently afterwards appeared with a basin in which were floating countless numbers of the slain 
still i saw them crawling about the cabin in every direction and it struck me that the youngsters might be usefully employed in catching them i accordingly sent for them when to my dismay i was told that they were nowhere to be found at last one of the topmen said that he had seen them chasing master spider among the boughs of the forest a vision of jaguars venomous sea snakes and other reptiles rose up before me and i began to fear that they might have met with some accident we looked towards the forest but they could nowhere be seen we shouted to them to show themselves but no answer came to our repeated hails i immediately ordered anselmo's canoe to be lowered and as soon as the brig had been brought safely to an anchor at a distance from the trees i paddled off to look for them i was quickly under the boughs but as far as my eye could reach water alone was to be seen with huge trees apparently growing out of it by sounding i found that the depth even some way in was fully six feet again and again i shouted but got no answer and as for seeing anything above my head that was impossible from the mass of sipos as anselmo called them or vines which hung in festoons from the branches of the trees uniting them in one vast network i began to fear that the youngsters had in their hurry to overtake spider slipped from aloft and fallen into the water where they might have stuck in the mud or been carried off by some voracious alligator watching for his prey going a little farther i again shouted when a cry came from among the branches above my head i looked up expecting to see the lads but could not make them out at last i distinctly heard tom's voice exclaiming here we are sir but spider will hold on by the boughs with his tail and we cannot get him along but that is nothing sir added gerald we are surrounded by hundreds of monkeys and are afraid that they will carry him off if we let him go again wring his neck and pitch him down and then come down yourselves i shouted out losing temper that's not so easily done sir cried gerald the monkeys may take it into their heads to carry us off no fear of that i shouted out tie spider's tail over his head and you will easily bring him down by some of these vines if you happen to fall into the water i will pick you up the youngsters did as i directed them though spider showed fight and bit gerald while he was trying to perform the operation tom however very wisely thought of tying his handkerchief over the monkey's head and now dragging him along they began to make their way down to the lower branches not being able however to ascertain how near the vines reached to the water they came down by some which hung eight or ten feet from the surface this was too great a height to drop from into the canoe supposing that i was losing patience and that i might punish them for their freak they let go and monkey and midshipmen came down by the run into the water where the three adventurers cut a ludicrous figure splashing spluttering and kicking till i got up to them the latter were not much the worse for their ducking but the monkey was very nearly drowned before i had helped him out we have got spider anyhow sung out tom not holding me in much awe but gerald took matters more seriously faith sir we could not help it he exclaimed the baste of a monkey would set off to join his brothers in the bush and if we had not gone after him they would have made a haythen of him to a certainty i suppose then master gerald you consider that he has become a christian under your instruction well sir answered gerald looking up with a comical expression which reminded me of an old shipmate of mine he is as good a christian anyhow as many who call themselves so and considering that he has got a tail he is a remarkable civilized baste well i will overlook your offence of quitting the ship without permission i said trying to keep from laughing you were not aware probably that you were to be left among the tops of the trees when we hauled off from them i don't accuse you of intending to desert thank you sir we will promise not to go monkey hunting again without your leave answered the two midshipmen in chorus as i was in no hurry to get on board and the youngsters were not likely to suffer from sitting in their wet clothes i paddled away for some distance among the trees the greatest number were palms but there were others of all descriptions of which i am unable even to give the names after going a little way we came to a somewhat more open space when we heard a peculiar chattering overhead while showers of sticks came pattering down on our heads on looking up to ascertain the cause we saw high above us among the tops of the tallest trees a whole clan of large bushy-tailed monkeys there must have been a hundred or more some old and some young gambolling about and playing all sorts of pranks no sooner did they catch sight of us than they stopped 
and scampered off helter skelter the old ones catching hold of the young ones in their arms all equally anxious to make their escape some took prodigious leaps catching the branches with their long tails and after a swing or two throwing themselves to another branch and so made their way amid the boughs till the whole of them were quickly lost to sight they however had not gone far when tom's quick eyes detected several bushy faces grinning out from among the boughs where they had concealed themselves we paddled on a short distance and then remained quiet when in a few minutes first one bolder than the rest came out from his hiding-place and then another and another uttering sharp cries presently the whole troop came back and began amusing themselves as before the spot for some reason or other suiting their tastes it was great fun i confess and tom and gerald enjoyed it immensely they declared that the monkeys were the same fellows who came to look at them and had threatened as they supposed to make them prisoners i had paddled for some distance into the forest when i considered that it was time to turn back for the sun was getting low it was just possible that i might lose my way and i suspected it would be no easy matter to find it in the dark how far the water might extend over the country i could not tell probably for miles and miles i had begun as i believed to direct the head of the canoe towards the brig steering by the rays of the sun which still came across the forest and struck the topmost boughs of the trees of which i occasionally caught a glimpse when presently tom caught sight of some tempting fruit like plums which hung from the branches almost within our reach i tried to get at them with my paddle by standing up in the canoe on finding this impossible tom and gerald volunteered to climb along the branch when they managed to get hold of a good number which they threw into the canoe though by the by they were nearly toppled down head foremost into the water when making the attempt i tried the plums and found them excellent knowing how welcome they would be on board we took as many as the canoe would hold no one enjoyed them more than spider who munched away at them with amazing gusto till his masters declared that he would burst if he took any more some time was occupied by gathering and eating the plums we had turned about so often that when i began to paddle back on my life i could not tell which direction to take not a gleam of sunlight could i see on any of the trees and before we had gone far the gloom of night began to settle down among the tall trunks i did not wish to spend a night in the forest with a chance of being capsized by an alligator or cowfish or grabbed by an anaconda well at all events we shall not starve said tom these plums are very pleasant after the salt pork and dried fish we have had between our teeth for the last few days you forget the turtle soup and the tortoises we did not have a very large share of the former in the gun-room answered gerald and the tortoises were such ugly-looking beasts that we did not take to them kindly that was your own fault then i remarked i should advise you to try the next you get sent in and you will find it superior to fish flesh or fowl dressed according to a receipt senhor guedes gave the cook on going round the spot where we fell in with the plums i discovered the branch on which we had first seen them and recollecting its position i was able to pull on in the direction we were then taking thinking that we might be possibly near enough to the ship to be heard the midshipmen and i shouted at the top of our voices but no reply came indeed among those huge trunks sounds penetrate to no great distance still hoping to reach the brig i persevered as far as i could judge in the same direction i felt that with all the scientific knowledge possessed by the white man how helpless he is in one of those mighty forests while a native would have found the way without the slightest difficulty monkeys poked out their heads from the boughs on which they nestled and chattered at us macaws parrots toucans and other strange birds screamed at us and gerald and tom declared that they saw huge snakes wriggling along the branches and about to drop down and attack us but i suspected they were merely sipos which seen in the uncertain light as we went along appeared to be moving at last i began to fear that we should not find the brig till daylight and should have to pass the night in the forest the canoe laden as she was with plums not allowing us space to lie down i proposed if we failed after a further attempt to find the brig that we should look out for a tree with wide spreading branches into which we could climb and remain till daylight but pray don't think of such a thing cried tom we should have a whole troop of monkeys down upon us and be carried off in our sleep by an army of anacondas i laughed at his fears though i thought that we should very likely be attacked by ants such as had almost taken the brig from us i never liked to be beaten in an object should it seem possible of attainment and so i persevered and again we all shouted but with the same want of success as before 
i thought that very possibly by this time we might be two or three miles away from the brig just as likely as near her for i confess i was extremely doubtful as to the direction we had taken well youngsters i am afraid there is no help for it i remarked if you do not like to sleep among the branches we must run the risk of turning our plums into jam we will make the canoe fast to a tree and try to get some rest one at a time however must keep watch though i don't think we run much risk of being attacked by human or savage foes i was looking out for a branch to which to make the painter fast when tom declared that he saw a light far off between the tall trunks by moving a little on one side i also caught sight of it and at once paddled away in that direction it grew brighter as we advanced and appeared to be elevated some little distance above the water i was very certain that it could not proceed from the brig it seemed indeed to be produced by a fire but how a fire could exist in such a place it was puzzling to say unless it was on the bank of the river or on an island elevated some height above the surface of the water at all events we were likely to meet with human beings who if natives would probably be able to pilot us back to the brig i told the youngsters to keep silent and paddled cautiously on it was necessary indeed to be very careful for fear of capsizing the canoe against a floating log or projecting branch unseen in the darkness after going on for some distance what was our surprise to find directly ahead a large platform secured to the trunks of several lofty palms elevated about six feet above the water a fire was burning in the centre round which were seated a number of dark-skinned natives with scarcely a particle of clothing on their bodies above the platform was a roof of palm leaves below which were hung a number of hammocks of various sizes the small ones containing children and under them were a variety of other articles while two canoes were made fast to the crossbeams which afforded support to the structure the flames from the fire lighted up the figures of the natives and cast a ruddy glare on the trunks of the trees the dark foliage the surrounding water and on our canoe as we approached the men perceiving us started up and seized their lances guessing that they understood spanish i shouted amigo amigo and paddling on towards them they were soon satisfied that we came with no hostile intent and as tom made fast the canoe to a ladder which rested against the platform they stretched out their hands to assist us up though unable to speak any language but their own they seemed to comprehend that we were officers and when i uttered the word navio they nodded to show us that they knew we had come from a ship out in the river and that we wished to return to her as i had no wish to pass the night among them i tried to explain to them that i would reward them well if they would at once pilot us back after some time i got them as i supposed to understand my meaning for they again nodded their heads and pointed in the direction from which we had come showing me that when i fancied i had been paddling out towards the stream i had in reality been directing my course inland they offered us some of their meal consisting of broiled fish and cakes made i suspect from the flower or pith of the very palm trees on which the platform was erected they gave us also some palm wine we did not ask how it was made but it tasted very well indeed our hosts showed every wish to be friendly the flooring of this strange habitation was i found on examination composed of the split trunks of small palms the hearth consisted of a mass of clay thick enough to prevent the heat from injuring the wood below the people i afterwards found from the consul belonged to a tribe of the guarinis who are the only inhabitants of this submerged region of the orinoco when the waters subside they take up their abode on shore their only vegetable food is what they obtain from the palm trees and they subsist generally on turtle tortoises and the flesh of the manatee or cowfish and other fish which they spear or take with nets some of the young women were pretty good-looking and wore scant petticoats made of the cabbage palm leaves but the men had on little more than a belt round the waist with a few leaves hung from it as i was afraid that my people would be going in search of us and very likely lose themselves i made the natives understand that i should be glad to take my departure they nodded and two of them got into the smallest of their canoes and paddled a little way to show that they were ready to pilot us shaking hands with all round the youngsters and i got into our canoe and followed our guides i had to exert myself however to keep up with them but as i knew that where they went my canoe could pass we made good way we had gone some distance when the sound of a gun reached us echoing from trunk to trunk throughout the forest but it was not easy to ascertain from what direction it came 
and had i been alone it would scarcely have served to guide me the natives however paddled on in their former course showing me that they knew perfectly well what they were about we soon came out into an open part of the river a short distance above where the brig lay and i at once made out her spars rising against the sky our absence had caused some anxiety to bevan and the rest he had just lowered a boat and was about to send norris and needham to look for us the natives were well satisfied with the reward i bestowed on them not so anselmo at seeing it given one bullet through the head or poke with a pike good enough for dem observed the rascal i resolved the next time i went plum picking to carry a compass and to get back before the sun should sink below the tops of the trees by the by the sun is often not to be obtained as a guide for i afterwards visited parts of the forest where even his rays could not penetrate we got under way the next morning as soon as the sea breeze reached us but again signor anselmo managed to get drunk as a fiddler and after we had nearly been run on shore i was obliged to bring up a fact of which he was totally unaware there he stood at his usual post shouting out to the helmsman starboard port steady and at last as grave as a judge he observed to me it's time to bring up captain us no make headway i see i should think not mate said needham vessels don't often go ahead with the anchor down we are not going astern either as we did yesterday eh it would have been useless to flog the fellow or to put him in the black list for he would probably have slipped into his canoe and left us to find our way as best we could besides when he was sober he was as good a pilot as could be desired i determined therefore to bear with him and to keep liquor out of his way i was fortunate in finding his calabash which i hove overboard and gave notice that i would flog any man who supplied him with liquor beyond his portion this had a good effect and anselmo kept sober for some time afterwards i made frequent trips in the canoe taking the youngsters and always returned with a good supply of plums we fell in with several families of the wild natives i have described they seemed quiet and well disposed though somewhat low in the scale of humanity i should like to give you an idea of the sort of scenery we met with starting from the ship we began to force our way under the branches and amongst dense bushes till we got into a part where the trees were much loftier and the lower branches were level with the surface of the water most of them covered with flowers besides the plums we found bunches of delicious fruit growing on the branches of a smaller species of palm frequently we heard the rattle of leaves overhead and caught sight of troops of monkeys peeping down among the thick foliage paddling on among the lofty trunks which rose like columns out of the water presently down came a shower of leaves and on looking up we discovered a flock of parrots or a family of trogons large gaily coloured birds with clamorous voices and heavy flight who made the branches shake as they alighted to seize the fruit pendant from them palm trees of various species prevailed there was no underwood or it had been destroyed by water but the cypos or vines hung in dense masses among the upper branches i wish that i could describe the wonderful birds we saw one perfectly black with a head-dress like an umbrella while some lovely specimens of the feathered tribe had white wings and claret-coloured plumage flowers were of all hues and of immense size some of the more lofty trees were literally covered with clusters of rich golden flowers on the decayed trunks we caught sight of crabs of every variety of tint and size watching for their prey while butterflies and dragonflies of gorgeous hues flitted amid the more open spots wherever the sunlight found its way some of the latter with crimson bodies and black heads and burnished wings others with green and blue bodies a fine region this for frogs but many of them live in trees finding i suppose that they are likely to be gobbled up if they keep as frogs in northern countries do in the water as night drew on we heard them hoo-hooing quack-quacking keeping up the strangest concert imaginable indeed had not the consul assured me that frogs produced the noise i should have supposed that they were caused by some species of night-bird however i am i confess no great hand at description nor had we a naturalist on board or i might have given you a better account of the various trees and curious things we met with now and then we caught sight of an alligator but the monsters generally betake themselves to pools and quiet places while the waters are as at present at their height by the by we did pass a town which was seen in the distance i did not touch at it but anselmo informed me that the inhabitants were engaged in a little civil war of their own murdering each other to their heart's content had we had time i dare say we might have supplied ourselves with monkey and sloth flesh 
opossums snakes crabs and a variety of birds but i doubt whether the crew would have appreciated the exertions of the sportsman at last anselmo informed me much to my satisfaction that we were drawing near to the termination of our voyage the trees receded to a distance and on either side of us appeared fields of grass i should think nearly a mile in width though web-footed birds here and there stalked over it not an animal was to be seen the reason of this was that the grass floated on the calm surface of the water i should think we must have sailed through at least fifteen miles of it at last we came to off the town of angostura though not a place possessed of many attractions i never dropped anchor with more satisfaction i was not sorry to get the jealous consul and his veiled lady out of the ship for as you may suppose i wanted to be back among more stirring scenes and escorted him and his wife on shore at the head of a score of blue jackets and five marines to make as imposing an appearance as i could having seen him reinstated in his abode and the consular flagstaff set up again with the flag of old england flying from it i delivered my dispatches from the governor of trinidad to the chief authority in the place and informed him that the majesty of england must not be insulted in the person of one of her consuls but senhor guedes is very jealous of his wife and that is all about it answered the governor of angostura who i found to my surprise was able to converse pretty freely in english such i had suspected was the case and i could not help feeling that i had been sent up on a fool's errand from the appearance of angostura i fancied that it must have been a place of some importance in the past days of spanish glory but like every other former dependency of that unhappy country it everywhere shows marks of decay there are churches and priests but the best thing it can boast of is a very good market in which being able to supply all our wants we revelled luxuriously on fresh provisions during our stay the town also can boast of the very fattest negress i ever set eyes on she would make her fortune in an exhibition in england or america the midshipman asked needham if he would like to marry her bless my heart no young gentleman she's big enough to be the wife of six men twice my size he answered i can think of nothing else to tell you about this remote city it has some commerce for there were three or four american vessels in the harbour loading with hides having paid farewell to the obnoxious consul who shedding a flood of tears gave me a hug which nearly drove the breath out of my body i returned on board and ordering the anchor to be weighed directed anselmo to pilot us back the way we had come and mark me my friend i added if you get drunk and run us on shore i will give you three dozen as sure as you are a living man but cap'n i would no do that same on no account he answered with a bland smile however i had given needham instructions to keep a watch on him and to throw overboard any liquor he might have stowed away three or four coconuts full of rum were discovered among his traps the contents of which were started and water substituted it was amusing to see anselmo's face when he found out the trick that had been played him never mind pilot it's better to go without your grog than have a taste of the cat observed needham patting him on the shoulder when you get home you shall have enough to keep you drunk for a week at least you will then be ready to pilot another of her majesty's ships up the river if one of them ever comes this way as we could now sail or drift on all day by sending the boats ahead occasionally to tow us off the trees we made good progress and soon reached the mouth of the river though our trip was not destitute of interest i can only hope that i shall never be sent up the orinoco again terence thanked jack for this description of his trip when they next met which they did off georgetown the capital of british guiana at the mouth of the demerara river its gaily painted wooden houses with broad verandas raised on supports some feet above the ground its canals and dikes and numerous windmills might make it easily mistaken for a dutch town were it not for the tall palm trees which rise in its midst and the rich tropical scenery around here the corvette and brig remained for some days and then sailed to join the squadron ordered to rendezvous at rio a bright lookout was kept for slavers which notwithstanding the treaty lately made by the brazilian government with england were known to swarm on the coast the local authorities like those of havana encouraging the nefarious traffic which put thousands of dollars into their purses End of chapter nineteen section twenty five of the three lieutenants 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty part one the corvette and brig part company the former chases a suspicious sail captures a full slaver adair in charge takes prize to bahia an important warning preparations for an attack anecdote of lieutenant wacy the tudor and supplejack had crossed the line and had got some way to the southward when a heavy gale came on such as is not often experienced in those latitudes it blew with especial fury during the night murray hove the corvette to and believed that jack would have done the same but when morning broke and the brig was nowhere to be seen from the deck of the corvette he could not help feeling somewhat anxious on the subject during the day the weather moderated and a lookout was kept for her from aloft two days passed however and she did not appear the wind was from the northeast and he hoped by a quick run to rio to have his anxiety soon brought to an end by finding that the supplejack had arrived before him morning had just dawned the breeze was fresh the tops of the seas sparkled in the rays of the rising sun when the lookout from aloft shouted a sail on the lee bow what is she asked adair who was officer of the watch a brig sir was the answer is she like the supplejack he inquired can't say sir she is anyhow running to the westward and the supplejack would be steering to the south you are right call the commander said adair to desmond the youngster had rejoined the ship at georgetown he himself then went aloft with his glass to have a look at the stranger by the time he came down murray was on deck she is certainly not the supplejack and as she is running in for some brazilian port far to the northward of rio she may possibly be a slaver we will overhaul her at all events said murray and the corvette bearing up in chase made all sail she could set the stranger did not at first discover that she was pursued and by the time that she did so the corvette had gained considerably on her she was then seen to be a large brigantine and by her square yards and white canvas lighted up by the rays of the sun murray was more than ever convinced that she was a slaver the chase had set all the sail she could carry and still kept well ahead of the corvette the weather as the day advanced gave signs of changing dark clouds gathered in the sky and squalls not very strong at first but sufficient to make the commander look with anxious eyes at his spars swept across the ocean the dark clouds as they rushed along changing the hitherto blue laughing waves to a leaden hue still the corvette persevered the crew were at their stations ready to shorten sail the moment it became absolutely necessary the eagerness of the chase to escape made it still more probable that she was a slaver she was dead before the wind carrying topgallant sails and royals and studding sails on either side a dark cloud passing over her threw her into shade on it went and once more the bright rays of the sun falling on her canvas brought her more clearly into view another squall swept by making the corvette's studding sail booms crack and bend as if they were about to break away from the braces hold on good sticks cried murray apostrophizing them the toughest spars will win the day the crew cast their eyes aloft fully expecting to see them carried away but they held on and the trim corvette went dashing forward amid the dancing seas which rose up foam-crested on either side hurrah exclaimed terence she is ours at that moment the squall had reached the chase and away flew her studding sails the booms breaking off at the irons still she held on her course the corvette was now rapidly gaining on her the attempt was made to rig another lower studding sail but that also was carried away almost as soon as set and in less than half an hour the corvette had got her well within range of her long guns but murray refrained from firing as long as he found that he was gaining on her it is useless to run the risk of injuring her spars he observed to adair she will haul down her colours when she finds that she has no hope of getting away 
those fellows are up to all sorts of dodges and will make every effort to escape said terence we will take in the studding sails at all events and be ready for him should he haul his wind said murray the light canvas was taken in with a rapidity which must have astonished the crew of the slaver just however as the operation was about to be commenced she had put her helm to port and braced her yards sharp up on the starboard tack but a couple of shot from the corvette one of which struck her starboard quarter showed her that she was too late and fearing that other iron missiles might overtake her she immediately hauled down her colours the corvette's topgallant sails and royals having been handed she also was brought to the wind and hove to on the weather beam of the prize murray now directed adair to go on board the brigantine with a midshipman and ten hands and to carry her to rio unless from a scarcity of provisions or want of water he should find it necessary to put into bahia or any other neighbouring port on the brazilian coast adair and desmond were quickly ready with their carpet-bags as were snatchblock and nine other men with their bundles and the boat which had meantime been lowered pulled off for the prize although there was some sea on yet as she was low in the water she was easily boarded she proved to be the donna maria a noted brazilian slaver which had often before escaped capture according to murray's directions adair sent back the captain and officers and some of her ill-looking crew who were likely to prove troublesome if left in her he found that though only measuring a hundred and fifty tons she had nearly five hundred slaves on board stowed away as thick as they could be packed between decks having had a remarkably quick run from the coast of africa the captain informed him that he had not lost more than twenty people as he looked down the main hatchway the haggard countenances of the mass of human beings packed close together as desmond observed like herrings in a cask showed him that had the voyage continued much longer the number of deaths would have been greatly increased although there was food enough and water for the slaves either the crew had hove overboard some of their own provisions or had brought but a small supply so that adair found but a scant allowance for himself and his men he therefore sent on board the corvette for such articles as he thought would be required just as all arrangements had been completed and he had put the brigantine on her course he saw the corvette haul her wind and stand away to the eastward as she did so murray signalized that a strange sail which he hoped to overhaul had hove in sight in that direction a sufficient number of the slaver's crew had been kept on board to attend to the unfortunate blacks and carry them their provisions and water adair himself went round among them and endeavoured to make them understand that he was their friend and that as soon as possible they should be sent back to africa at first they looked on the englishmen with an expression of terror in their countenances many of them believing that they would be taken on shore to be killed and eaten or to be offered up to the white man's fetish fortunately one of the seamen who had been long on the coast could make himself understood by some of them and by his means and kind treatment terence succeeded at length in banishing their fears one of the brazilians also spoke a little english and so was able to act as interpreter pedro was a better-looking fellow than most of his companions and by the kind way he treated the blacks terence was inclined to trust him he declared that poverty alone and a wish to support his family had induced him to ship on board the slaver and that it was the last voyage he would ever make these countrymen of mine are great rascals he observed you take care what they do or they play you one great trick pedro then told adair that the brigantine was somewhat leaky and that it had been necessary to pump her out at every watch he had once ordered the well to be sounded and snatchblock reported two feet of water in the hold he accordingly ordered the pumps to be rigged and set some of his own people to work them pedro again came aft and assured him that he felt certain he could pick out a score of more of blacks who could be trusted on deck and that they would willingly take the duty glad to escape from the confinement of the hold we will try them said terence and in a short time pedro sent up the number he had mentioned all of them well-made stalwart negroes the scant clothing they wore exhibited however how much they had suffered by confinement even during their comparatively short run across the atlantic half of them quickly understanding what was required set to work with a will being relieved by their companions by their exertions the brigantine was at length almost freed from water during the night it had however again gained on the pumps and the weather coming on worse soon after daybreak terence judged it prudent to bear up for bahia 
he was thankful to believe that he would soon be in smooth water for the poor slaves suffered dreadfully by the way the vessel tumbled about in the heavy seas and several of the weak ones were found to have died during the night the brazilians hauled them out without the slightest exhibition of feeling and hove the bodies overboard as if they had been so many dead sheep the heat and effluvium which arose from below were almost unbearable the instant the hatches which had necessarily been closed during the night were taken off it was the first full slaver desmond had ever been aboard i have always heard the african coast abused but i can only say that i should be ready to go and serve there for the sake of catching some of these rascally slavers before they have had the opportunity of making the poor blacks suffer so horribly as they must do during the middle passage he exclaimed as he warmed with indignation at what he witnessed at last a short time before nightfall the brigantine entered the harbour of bahia which is easy of access and came to an anchor at some distance from the town scarcely had she brought up than the weather moderated and terence began to regret that he had not continued his course for rio still he hoped that murray judging by the weather would take it for granted that he had put in there and would come and look for him it was too late that evening to communicate with the authorities several boats however came alongside though as no officer appeared among the people in them adair would not allow any one to come on board with the exception of an official who was sent he said by the captain of the port to make inquiries about the vessel at last all the boats took their departure there was no moon though the stars shone forth brightly overhead reflected on the calm surface of the water it was rather dark all around where the brig lay here and there only distant lights glimmering from the shore the watch of which ben snatchblock had charge was set and adair and desmond retired into a small cabin on one side of the deck to take supper well i hope these poor fellows may be sent back safely to their homes said desmond i am afraid a good many more will die before they get there if they are not placed in some healthy spot and allowed to take exercise first none of them will ever get back to their homes answered terence they are all brought some hundreds of miles from the interior and would be quickly seized and carried back into slavery were the attempt to be made they will be sent to sierra leone or some of them may find their way to liberia a colony established some years ago for liberated blacks from the north american states adair was giving desmond further information on the subject when pedro put his head in at the door senor capitan i want to have one word with you he said putting his finger to his mouth you be on the watch i heard things said by the people in de boats and i make sure they come off and take all de slaves away and knock you and your people on de head hist hist don't let my comrades know i tell you or dey cut my throat as sure as i now a living man no time to lose adair asked pedro further questions but he could elicit no more information pedro was evidently in a hurry to be gone and again making a sign to show that caution was necessary he stole forward keeping close under the bulwarks as if afraid of being observed the information pedro has given us must not be neglected observed adair he may be mistaken but if the brazilians think that they can get hold of the slaves they will try to do so without scruple and will cut the throats of every one of us should they find it necessary to carry out their object go and turn out our people and i will have a talk with snatchblock on the subject desmond making his way forward roused up the prize crew cautiously awaking each man separately so that the slaver's people should not hear them adair followed him on deck and told snatchblock what he had heard well sir to my mind the first thing we have to do is to secure the brazilian fellows we have on board for if we are attacked by their friends from the shore as pedro thinks likely we shall have them maybe playing us some trick answered ben either they will let the slaves loose and set them up to murdering us or if they can get hold of arms they will set on us themselves should they see a chance of helping our enemies adair thought ben's advice good and told him to get a sufficient number of lengths of rope to secure the fellows this was quickly done and adair and his men went into the berth and soon had all the brazilians secured almost before they were awake he had pedro lashed like the rest adair whispered however into his ear that he did so for his own sake as should he be suspected of having given the englishman information he probably would be murdered by his countrymen pedro indeed seemed perfectly satisfied to be so treated they no countrymen of mine though he answered in a low voice they brazilians i true-born portuguese well whatever you are i am much obliged to you 
and hope to reward you some day for the assistance you have given us answered adair i should have taken the fellow to have a larger share of negro than white blood in him by his looks observed adair to desmond as they went aft however i really believe that he is honest and we should not despise his warning he had all the arms and ammunition to be found on board collected each of his crew being provided with a musket and a brace of pistols in addition to their cutlasses he and desmond also armed themselves a dozen spare muskets which he had carefully looked to and loaded were arranged some aft others midships and forward there were also two small brass guns used for signals rather than defence no shot however could be found for them so he sent a couple of men to collect all the nails and scraps of iron they could find in the carpenter's storeroom they will make cruel wounds but it will be the fellow's own fault if they venture to attack us should some of them stick in their bodies he observed as the guns were loaded a dozen boarding pikes were also found and served out to the men i rather suspect that these weapons will prove more serviceable in the hands of our stout fellows than muskets or pistols which take time to load observed adair they may serve us in good stead should the brazilians attempt to climb up the side these arrangements being made adair and desmond returned to the cabin to finish their supper which they had just begun when pedro came to them don't you think after all that that portuguese fellow may have been trying to frighten us for some object of his own perhaps to ingratiate himself into your favour asked desmond no no i think not answered adair the brazilians have played similar tricks on captured vessels before in this very port and they are capable of any atrocity there was an old friend of mine named wacy a capital fellow kind-hearted and brave as true a man as i ever met with we were shipmates for a short time on the coast of africa rogers and murray knew him well and liked him as much as i did he was one of those quiet unpretending characters who don't know what is in them except to those with whom they are intimate we chased and captured a small schooner with a hundred and fifty slaves on board he was put in charge of her with ten hands and directed to take her to sierra leone we having received on board her former crew that he might not be troubled with them soon after he parted company from us a heavy gale sprang up from the eastward and he was blown off the land the schooner one of those slightly put together craft built expressly for slavers sprang a leak and the water gained so fast on them that it was as much as the crew with a few of the blacks who were to be trusted could do to keep her afloat his only chance of saving the lives of his crew and himself as well as of the blacks was to run for the brazilian coast the schooner was also short of provisions and water and had he attempted to beat up for sierra leone he knew that most of the blacks must perish even if he contrived to keep her afloat the weather in no way moderated and though he set an example to his men by taking his turn at the pumps all hands working with a will he scarcely expected to get across the atlantic still by attending to the unfortunate blacks and by allowing a few to come on deck at a time he managed to keep them alive at length when he was about a week's run from bahia he fell in with an american brig he having hoisted a signal of distress the american hove to and he went on board her he explained his condition to the master who seemed to be a well-disposed kind-hearted man well i have no objection to receive you and your white crew on board my vessel said the master but as to the blacks i can have nothing to do with them they must sink or swim if they can what you don't suppose that i would desert the unfortunate wretches exclaimed wacy indignantly well they are but negroes and it is a fate which befalls many of them they seem born to it answered the master coolly i am much obliged to you for your offer to receive me and my people though i cannot accept it if we are lost our deaths will be at your door that won't be a pleasant recollection for you said wacy cannot help it mr lieutenant answered the skipper the blacks as i say must take their chance and it seems to me that if you and your men refuse to come aboard my brig when i offer to receive you that your desk will be at your own door i would rather die than desert the unhappy blacks and i believe that my men will stick by me answered wacy now captain i tell you what i will do i have a fortune of seven thousand pounds and on the word of a british officer and you will take that i hope i will put it in black and white that i will pay over every farthing if you will receive the blacks on board and carry them to the nearest port you can make come that is a better freight than you have every day for your brig i suspect the skipper thought a minute then shook his head no if you were to give me twenty thousand pounds down on the nail i could not take the negroes aboard my brig they would pollute her we should probably have a fever break out or if we escaped 
that every man of my crew would leave her directly we entered port in vain wasey endeavoured to persuade the skipper to alter his resolution he was determined not to take the negroes on board at length wasey saw there was no use in pressing him further perhaps the skipper thought that he might never touch the seven thousand pounds but i can answer for it and so would every one who knew wasey that he would have religiously paid it to the last farthing you have made up your mind not to receive the blacks and i have made up my mind not to desert them said wasey wishing him good-bye a prosperous voyage to you and i can only say that i hope for your sake as well as ours that we may manage to get the schooner into bahia i should not wish to have my conscience troubled as yours will be if you hear that we are lost having purchased all the provisions and water the american could spare wasey returned to the schooner and made sail for the westward while the american vessel stood away on her course he divided the water and most of the provisions he had obtained among the starving blacks and their strength renewed they were able to assist better at the pumps than they were before still the powers of all on board were taxed to the uttermost every one however knew that their lives depended on their exertions and worked away till they were ready to drop they could just keep the schooner afloat and that was all the wind continued fair and by the time the last drop of water was expended and the farina and other food for the blacks was used up they made this port of bahia wasey now hoped that his chief troubles were over the blacks had got to trust him and so when the schooner was brought to an anchor they willingly laboured as before to keep her afloat believing that all was right he went on shore to communicate with the authorities leaving the quartermaster in charge of the schooner the officials detained him for some time and sent him first to one person and then to another thus keeping him employed till nightfall at last he pulled off to the schooner there she lay all right and he hoped to be able to get the leak stopped and to carry the poor blacks to sierra leone where they could be set free when he stepped on board he inquired if all had gone well during his absence yes sir was the quartermaster's answer some brazilian officers came off in a number of boats and told me that they had been sent to land the blacks as all seemed right i did not prevent them from coming on board at once ordering the blacks up they made every one of them get into the boats which at once pulled away up the harbour the officers were very polite and seemed to be doing everything regular though i was just a little suspicious when i saw three large boats full of men with a good number of muskets among them close to us watching as it were how matters were going when the boats with the blacks on board pulled away they followed and no one since then has come near us i hope it's all right sir right exclaimed wasey feeling confident that he had been duped i am afraid that it's very wrong i have made every arrangement with the authorities to have the blacks housed on shore while the schooner is under repair and to receive them back whenever i may wish and i cannot understand how any government officers should venture to take them off till my return next morning he went on shore when the authorities declared that they knew nothing of the matter he then found that some fellows dressed up as officers had been sent off by slave dealers to play the trick and get possession of the unfortunate negroes in vain he endeavoured to regain them not a particle of information could be obtained as to where they had been carried except that they had probably been immediately disposed of over the country thus after his noble self-sacrifice and the exertions he had made to save the lives of his black-skinned fellow-creatures he had the mortification to find that they had been carried off into slavery and that he had nothing but the bare hull of the schooner for his pains yes by the by he had more than that he had the satisfaction of his own conscience and that was worth having i did not hear the account from himself but i got it from one of the men who was with him i am pretty sure that i am right in all particulars now let us go on deck and hear what report snatchblock has to make perhaps after all pedro may be mistaken and we shall not receive a friendly visit as he expects from the slavers however we will take care not to be the victims of a trick like that played on wasey anything stirring snatchblock asked adair as he and desmond went on deck nothing that i can make out sir except that a little time back a small boat pulled across our bows and returned to the shore we were all at the time as quiet as mice when the cat is about and maybe the fellows in her thought that we were keeping no watch aboard the brigantine we will show them that we are wide awake enough if they come off to play us any trick answered adair laughing he found his men sitting down with their arms by their sides ready for action and felt satisfied that they would do their best to beat off any enemies who might attempt to take the vessel End of chapter twenty part one